myths. Myths are the sacred texts that explain the world and man's experience. It seems simple, doesn't it? Sacred texts that explain the world and man's experience. Man's experience of the world. Everything that we know, everything that exists or will exist or that we think exists, has its roots in understanding and the basis of mythology. Myths reflect the universal concerns of man throughout history. They talk about birth and death and the afterlife. Who are we? Where did we come from? What happens to us when we die? What is this thing that happens after we pass, the life after death? How did we come about? How did our world come into being? All of these things are explained through the understanding of myth. And where did good and evil come from? Are we all good? And if God is all good, how can there be evil? All of these things can be explained through the myths. Myths tap into a universal cultural narrative. So from cultures from the Middle East to South America, all the way to Polynesia, you'll see similar stories. So we'll see the story of the flood, Noah and the ark. The same story comes to us from the Hindu myths, and they also come to us from the Sumerian tablets, the Babylonian epic, uh, epic of Gilgamesh, for those of you who have ever had a chance to read that. It talks about the story of the flood. So these universal stories that help us understand where do we come from, how do we understand the world in which we live, these things are shared by many, many faiths. So the uniqueness by which we approach these stories really is without merit. We think that each of our cultures and each of our religions has the unique story. And the beauty of this is that all of these stories are interrelated and interconnected since the dawn of time. Myths are not fairy tales, and they're not always optimistic. Myths are often warnings. They present to us signs that help us understand who we are and how we should live within the moral context and social context of our societies. They help us understand that our actions have consequences that go far beyond ourselves in the present time. There are four functions of myths, and this was explained to us by the great uh, professor of myth, Joseph Campbell. For those of you who have ever had a chance to watch The, the Power of Myth, is a, a great um, audio series and television series that was narrated by Bill Moyers many years ago. And there's a great book called The Power of Myth. And I highly encourage, if you get a chance, if you're interested in mythology, to read, these, uh, to read this book. But it talks about myths in four functions. The first one is the, medical, the metaphysical. It's opening our eyes to the power and the awesomeness of the divine around us, the mystery and all of the things created. Cosmological. It helps us understand our universe and our place within the universe. Then we have sociological. It helps us to validate and to support the social order. So many of our myths, for example, or the stories that come to us through mythology, we think, for example, of the Ten Commandments. And I'm not implying that the, these are mythological, but they come to us from the ancient Greek myths, this idea of do not kill, uh, listen to your parents, uh, obey your father and mother, follow these certain laws. And myths are set up to help us understand that there is a place for all of us and that we all live within the context of a society and these myths help us and guide us to live accordingly. And that brings us to the pedagogical stage, which is to help guide us through the stages of life. These are the rites and the rituals. So when we go from being young men and young women into being adults, there are rites and rituals, there are myths that help guide us through these stages. And so consequently, when we think of the four functions of myths, it goes from metaphysical, cosmological, sociological, and pedagogical. Pedagogical. These are the most important functions, and to keep this in mind, as you're listening to the stories that we're going to talk about today, which one of these roles does it fulfill? Is it one or more? Ancient Greece was filled with gods led by the towering Olympians. So we see here Zeus, Hera, Apollo, Poseidon, Athena, and other giants of Greek mythology. We prayed to these gods the same way and for the same reasons that we do today. The ancient Greeks prayed alone, and they also prayed in communities, and they would often gather at the temples to do their worship and their sacrifices. These gods were prayed to because they believed that these gods controlled the minutia of their lives. When we think about the ancient gods of Greece, for example, we have the 12 great gods 
of Olympus. When we get into Hinduism, they take that to the next degree. It goes from 33 gods to 33,000 gods to, in the end, 33 million gods of Hinduism that controlled every single nuance and minutia of your life. And so consequently, they helped them understand the good and the bad because the gods were not always good. Sometimes the gods were also bad. Homer described the gods and the goddesses of Olympus as rulers with human traits. They were jealous, they were prideful, they were angry, but they had one benefit, they were immortal. And so consequently, all of these traits allowed them to live and to experience and to experiment with people and to be in battles, to have be angry, but yet they continued to live on whether they were in torment, pain, or happiness. What I'd like to do now is to help compare these religions to what we know today. And I make a presumption in most of my lecture halls that most people come from a Judeo-Christian background and they have some understanding of Islam as well. And so as we go through this lecture series, I'm also going to talk with you a little bit more about Islam as we approach the Holy Lands to help understand the context of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And I want to do today is take all of those and then focus it on Greek mythology. Where did these stories that we know today from Judeo-Christian society and Judeo-Christian beliefs come to us? Which of these come to us from Greek mythology? Monotheism. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all focused in monotheism. Catholics, being a Catholic myself, many people get the idea that Catholics really focus on three gods, which is somewhat true, but it's really a single god with a triune godhead, which is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So even in the depths of Catholicism, in monotheism, there's a tendency to go to polytheism. The earliest roots, for example, of the Canaanites before Christianity, before Judaism, I should say, were actually polytheistic. So if you remember the story when Moses goes up to the mountain, right? And he goes up to receive the Ten Commandments. And when he comes back down, what does he see? He sees his brother Aaron praying that they'd all taken their gold and they had made what? A golden calf, right? And so even then, these people were not sure about this single God, this, this God of Moses, the God of Aaron, even Aaron himself, being close to the man who would bring down the Ten Commandments, he wasn't sure. And so this idea of polytheism is in our nature as human beings. We believe in polytheism because it helps us understand the nature of our world. So the Greeks believed in many gods with 12 primary gods, and Zeus is the most powerful by far. So consider that in early Christianity, the earliest Christians were in Greece. So we have Paul's letter to the Thessalonians in Thessaloniki, not too far from here, to the Ephesians in Ephesus in Turkey, and then we have to the Corinthians in Corinth, not far from here as well. And so to help these people understand the idea of 12 who they had already known the 12 gods, the story of Jesus and the 12 apostles became a very easy story for these people to understand because they helped them. As these people had grown up with these 12 gods on Mount Olympus, now we have the story of this new God, Jesus, and his 12 apostles. And so for the Greeks, this became a very easy story to understand and to help them syncretize to their ancient faith and their own gods. And so these stories, these numbers become very important. In the next lectures, I'll be talking about the number 40, the number 7, the number 3, these numbers and how they're important to Judaism and Christianity and Islam. And here we see the earliest Christians tying in the number 12 to their earliest Greek believers because it helped them understand because of their belief in the 12 gods of Greece. Omnipotent, for Jews, Christians, and Muslims, God is all-powerful. According to ancient Greek myths, the gods are powerful, but they have faults. So you'll learn in all of these great Greek myths that the gods are powerful, but they also suffer from human faults. Is God the creator? For Jews, Christians, and Muslims, God was the creator of man, the universe, and all things. But... For the ancient Greeks, the gods were not the creators. They came as sons of Titans, and the Titans were the son of Gaia, 
and Gaia was the earth and Uranus the sky, so Uranus, which later became the planet. The gods were descendants of the children and of the earth and the sky. This is a story that's told in mythology around the world. We'll find it in the Maoris of New Zealand, that the earth, sky, and the father were one. Um, you'll find these stories all around the world, from Polynesian mythology to Middle Eastern mythology to African mythology, that this idea of the earth mother and the sky father, these are very interesting dynamics that guide. And this was the same that came to us from the Greek myths. Omnibenevolent is God all good. For Jews and Christians, God is good. For Christians, God was powerful and all good. For Jews, God was powerful and sometimes vengeful. This is the struggle that we have today in understanding our world. I would bet that almost everyone in this room has this question on a, on a daily basis if you consider it when you watch the news and you see how are people suffering? Why did these group of people get hit with this awful storm? The people of Haiti, for example, we see year after year these people suffer and we say, how is it possible that a God who is all powerful and all good lets these people suffer? That's a struggle. That's a challenge for us to answer if we believe that God is all powerful and all good. But if you believe that God is not all good, now you can make sense of this. Because perhaps that God is punishing them. Perhaps this God is engaged in a lesson. Perhaps these people are meant to suffer for another benefit. But it becomes easier when you think that your gods might be deceitful, might be full of trickery, or might be downright angry and vengeful gods. And so in the realm of polytheism, polytheism allows us to understand better the evil nature of many parts of our world and our lives. Greek gods were very human in their personalities. They were evil as often as they were good. They felt jealousy and they felt pride. They were angry and they also felt love and kindness. So these, these things balanced their lives much as they balance our lives. Does God love you? For Jews and Christians, God loves us and wants us to live according to the law. God wants good things for us, right? But the ancient Greeks, gods had favorites. They had favorite people. They had favorite kings. And these people were looked upon kindly because they had done the right sacrifices and prayers. But they despised certain men. And they went after certain men and cursed certain men and punished them for wrongdoing. This is also similar to the early understanding of the, of the Jewish God, Yahweh, who was a warrior God. And he was often a punishing God, vengeful God, on those who did not follow the rules and the law. God answers prayers for us, right? For Jews and Christians, God will answer prayers. For Muslims, God will pray, answer the prayers of all of those who submit themselves and follow the rules of Allah. In fact, the word Muslim means one who submits to Allah, to the will of Islam, to the will of Allah. Ancient Greek gods would usually, but not always, listen to prayers. Special attention was given to prayers that were made with sacrifices. And if you really wanted to get the gods' attentions, you would sacrifice 100 oxen, which was called a hecatomb. And the hecatomb was then sacrificed, and they would take the fatty thighs, and they would burn those on the fires at the altars. Is God omnipresent? For Jews, Christians, and Muslims, God is everywhere. And if we're pantheistic, we believe that God is in all things, eminent in all things at all times. But the gods of ancient Greece lived on Mount Olympus. So they were available to us. They could be heard. They had magic speed and power. So if we called out to them, they could hear us. But they weren't necessarily invisible and they weren't present to us at all time. So then we'll say, is God invisible? Well, for Jews and Christians and Muslims, we can't see God, so God is, to us is invisible. But in this respect, we would say that the Greek gods would often take the form of man, and then we would also say that these gods would also take the forms of animals. So Zeus appeared as a swan to Leda and an eagle to Ganymede. So we see it in many forms, many paintings, and you'll see it in the sculptures of ancient Greece that these gods often became man, and so when you look at the ancient temples, you'll see them depicted in human form. Is God behind natural forces? For Jews and Christians, God was used to explain natural forces. 
which could help or harm people, such as the plagues. So if God is in nature, if God is nature, then God is also the natural force that harms. But the Greek gods help us to explain natural phenomena as well. Poseidon was the god who caused earthquakes. Helios, or Apollo, was the sun. Demeter controlled whether the harvest was good or bad. So consequently, you could blame or give thanks and offerings and sacrifices to those gods in the hope that they would reward you. Moral codes. The Bible contains the code for how we're supposed to live. It's the Ten Commandments. And these come to us in the uh, books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. However, the Greeks had no such moral code. They had a couple of laws that they were, people were expected to live by. Number one, men should worship the gods. Men should look after visitors and strangers. And men should not murder. So it was a very simple moral code by which they were asked to live. The Word of God, the written history of Christians and Jews is contained in the Bible, but what did the Greeks have? The Greeks really didn't have any scripture to speak of. What they had, however, was the collected works of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. They're regarded as the most important source of knowledge among the ancient Greeks. And he records in there, in the Iliad and the Odyssey, the stories of the gods. Temples and churches. For Christians and Jews and even Muslims, we go to temples, to churches, to synagogues, and to mosques. However, the Greek temples were also temples for the gods. People would come there to pray, but the offerings and the sacrifices were often done on an altar outside. These prayers, these sacrifices, these rituals brought people together. They brought people together to worship in faith and in shared understanding of their gods. And this is where these stories would often take on new life. These stories would change from one generation to the next. As the generations changed, the stories would change because they wanted the young ones to remain interested. They wanted the young ones to remain connected to their faiths. So the ancient stories would often change, and one generation would tell their children a very different understanding, a very different story, to help them become interested and to continue to tell those stories throughout their, throughout their lives and to make them interesting for their children as well later on. As they grew and they started to become more interdependent on each other and they were interested in what happens after death, different sorts of religions started to come up. Their understanding started to change. And new cults came that promised a more individual relationship with the divine. And you can see that this is why Christianity became so popular because it was around this time that people were interested in having a more personal relationship with their God that Jesus comes. And what does he do? He calls his father Abba, which in his language was father, a very close. It's not like daddy, but some people explain it as daddy, but it's a close personal relationship. And so people in Greece at this time, when, the, when Jesus, the newest Christians came, they were interested because these cults in Greece had started to help them understand that they wanted a more personal understanding of their God. So they also had priests. Using the Holy Scriptures, a rabbi or Christian priest or minister can interpret the will of God and lead people to God. He can also be a counselor. For Catholics, a priest can also give forgiveness granted through God. Greek priests could be men or women, and their job was to carry out the rites. They weren't really there to give counsel. They were there for the function of rites and rituals. So they would go to a seer often to learn about what would come in their lives, but they would go to the priest for the rituals. And a seer would look at signs such as the entrails, or they would predict birds. And so it's this understanding when you go to Rome and you understand the story of Romulus and Remus, the two brothers who fought for control of Rome, that Romulus was the one who was uh, found to be the king. And how was he discovered to, or found to be king? Because when they were standing on the hills, a flock of birds swarmed around Romulus. And by that, the seers said, ah, this must be the one who was meant to be the king of Rome. And so consequently, this Greek influence that came all the way over, and you'll see this, the Greeks came all the way over to Rome, and then after them you have the Etruscans and then the Romans, and then afterwards the Romans gained power so that when Greece was in its decline, 
the, the Romans came back over and conquered Rome. So where all of you got on the bus back and forth to going downtown, you looked across and you saw that big arch. That was the Arch of Hadrian. So that was the great Roman Emperor Hadrian who had come all the way back to Greece to conquer them. And so he put that arch at the very space in the middle of their temples because right on the other side of that is the temple to Zeus, right? So he wanted to align himself with this idea of being a god. And so he built his arch right in the middle on the edge of the Agora, right near the temple of Zeus. Very interesting, but it all has its place in understanding these stories. So oracles like the one at Delphi gave advice based on similar signs from the gods. How many of you had a chance to go to Delphi? A few of you. Fantastic. Just a beautiful trip out there. Bit of a hike to get up there, but what a gorgeous view. And when you consider that these people built these things thousands of years ago and their understanding of, of nature and gods, it's really a, a tremendous uh, um, understanding of, of where they came from. Now, life after death. For Jews, there's a mixed story about where, what happens after you die. Now, when I was in the seminary, I took a course in Jewish studies, and the priest or the rabbi said to me, said, you know what? All Jews go to the same place when you die? Mm, yes. Moses and Rabbi Akiva will be giving the constant lessons on, Jewish, on, on the Torah and the Talmud. Oh, for those who are righteous, this is eternal bliss. But for the wicked, for the wicked, this is eternal suffering, yes? And it's true. So their understanding is that if you truly are one with God, if you truly are one with the Torah, that this life is going to be constant teachings of the Torah and the Talmud, and this is going to be a joy, right? But if you're not so aligned, it's going to be torture. So what do Jews actually believe happens to them after death? There's no simple answer. If you talk to what two Jews, you're probably going to get three different answers. And I have this conversation with my Jewish friends frequently because they all have very different understandings. And even among themselves, one synagogue will say one thing and another will say another. And certainly then you talk with the different groups of, of Jews from Reformed to Orthodox, and they have very, very different understandings. But in simple terms, what they understand is that that there is a place where they will go after death, but they really don't know what it is. And I think that that is really a fair and about as honest as interpretation as you can get. Because really anyone who says that they know anything more than that is a little bit more than the conjecture. So I love my Jewish friends for saying, you know what, at the end of it all, we really don't know. Life after death for Christians, however. After death, Christians believe that the soul goes to heaven if the person has lived a good, lived a good life. And if they haven't if asked for forgiveness from a priest for, for dying, they're going to go to hell. Repentant sinners may go to purgatory as a place where they would pray for mercy. Now, people would say that there's some scriptural understanding of this. Other people would say that there isn't a scriptural understanding. It comes to us more as a way of helping understand that we want a middle place because no one lives a perfect life. And if we truly desire to be with God, why wouldn't God create a place where we could atone for our sins? So goes the understanding. The Greeks also believed in an afterlife. They believed in an underground world that was known as Tartarus, which was ruled by Hades. We actually called it Hades, but Hades is the god of the underworld. And so Tartarus is the place where we would go. In the Odyssey, Odysseus visits the entrance to the underworld and speaks with those he's known. So he speaks with Agamemnon, Achilles, and his mother. There was even a part of Tartarus reserved for wicked men and a part reserved for the good. As in Christianity, the souls were judged to decide which realm they would go to. Interest in the afterlife led the Greeks to create new forms of religions and cults. So we had the ancient 12 gods, and then afterwards, we started to see other gods come up and a different understanding for what happened when people died. By the 4th century BCE, so the 4th century BC, cults claimed to offer purification by cleansing members of the stain of humanity. So let's think about that, the stain of humanity. In our terms today, Judeo-Christian understanding, what would we call the stain of humanity? Original sin, right? Just to give you an idea so that this all gels together from a historical perspective, at the very same time that this idea was coming, this understanding of cleansing us from our stain of humanity, the first books of the Pentateuch were being written. Genesis was being written. And what happens in Genesis? God creates Adam and Eve. And what happens with Adam and Eve? 
they then introduce original sin into the Garden of Eden, right? So when we see the connectedness here, we see the connectedness at this time, the Greeks were introducing this idea of original sin, cleansing the stain of humanity. And this is the exact same time that the books of the Old Testament are written. The books of Genesis is being written. And so this influence is happening in this part of the world where people are now beginning to understand and reason, how is it that we are sinful? Why do we do wicked things? Is it our fault? Do we choose this? No. It's because we're born with original sin. It's the stain of our humanity that stains our lives and causes us to choose evil. So the foundations for the new religions were emerging, and then when Christianity swept the the ancient world, it carried with it the beliefs of this one single God washing away sin of human corruption and sin, and, and, the, and, and sinfulness through rites and reverence to the, to the ancient texts. So we have Judaism coming in, talking about the rites and the rituals, and then Jesus as a Jew comes and he says, ah, oh, there's a different way. And let me show you a personal relationship with God. Let me show you how you can choose to eliminate the sin from your life. You can choose, you can follow me, for I am the way the truth, and the light, and no one can come to the Father but through me. So this personal relationship that helps them understand the nature of their sinfulness and that he came to redeem himself, to die to redeem all of mankind from their sinfulness. So it was with this understanding that they preached these gospels to the earliest Christians, Greek, Christian Greeks, and they understood it and they were willing to understand it because it fit with their understanding of a sinful world. The power of the dead. Ancient Greeks believed that the dead could reach out to impact our lives in the afterlife. So they sought the favor of their ancestors with honors and offerings. And they also believed that their own fate after death was tied to their participation in religious cults. Ah, do we hear this now? If you participate in the religious cults, if you come to our meetings, you come to our services, guess what? You're not going to have any problems after you die. We're going to look after you. And so it's this idea now that we start to get the idea of regular participation and that participation was necessary in these rites and, religio- these rites and rituals to avoid what we would call mortal sin, a sin that would lead us to death and a death in afterlife as well, that there could be no redemption for mortal sin. But by going to services, you would be relieved from this mortal sin. Festivals. Festivals were a very important part of Greek religion. They were public events with a lot of music and singing and dancing. Later rituals at the Festival of Dionysus, there would be processions and parades. And the worship of Dionysus lasted all the way through Roman times. It actually became the god best as well. And these parties, these uh, Roman uh, parties often involved orgies and drinking contests. We have them still today. It's called college. So these services and these rites and rituals live on even today through the Greek societies. Make no mistake, that was what they were intended for. (laughs) Ancient Jews offered sacrifices to God in a way similar to the ancient Greeks. For Christians, God does not require sacrifices, but he asks for prayer, devotion, and good behavior. So the Jews would make offerings in the same way as the Greeks. They would do the burnt offerings. So when we think about even the sacrifices, so when we think about on Mount Moriah, that Abraham was called to sacrifice his firstborn son. And he was willing to sacrifice his son to the altar of the God. But instead, God says at the last second, no, you don't have to kill your son. And, Mo, and um, Mo, uh, Abraham, I'm sorry, uh, kills the ram instead. So it's these ideas of these sacrifices that stay with us all the way from Greek times into Jewish times as well. This idea of sacrifice comes to us from very ancient roots. For ancient Greeks, the way to worship a god was to make a sacrifice. And as I mentioned before, they would pour wine or olive oil or milk on the altars. And then oftentimes they would also burn a an ox, or they would take the fatty part of the calf uh, or the, the oxen and they would put the thigh on the fire and they would burn it. And this was the way to make the offering to God. This was foods for the God. Now we'll talk about some signs from above. God, Greeks seeking guidance and help from above saw oracles as a direct communication with the gods. So in the same way that many of us would see ministers or priests 
bishops or the pope as a direct communication with the God. The Greeks saw these oracles, and so they would come and they would ask the, the oracles questions, and then they would divine these things through the formation of birds, lightning, or even the rustling of leaves. And we'll talk about how it could be even the rustling of leaves. So the oracle at Dodona was actually one of the first major spots for the oracles, and they believed that Zeus was through the sacred oak tree. So they would come and they would talk to the oracle that was at the sacred oak tree, and they would ask questions directly of the oak, and then as the winds would blow and the leaves would rustle, the oracle would explain the answers to their questions. And so it's this idea of the oracle, the idea of the oak tree, that we come to understand a little bit more to the, when we fast forward to Celtic times and the Vikings, the importance of the oak tree. The Vikings would later link the oak tree to the god Thor, the Norse god of thunder and the protector of mankind. The Celts also related the oak tree with the thunder god Taranis. So the oak is prone to lightning strikes. And when a lightning strike would come, it would never break apart an oak tree, right? So how powerful must this tree be that a lightning bolt that could kill someone, could burn buildings down, which would shatter entire houses, but this tree would be standing after the strike of a lightning bolt. And then after a lightning bolt would strike, sometimes they would see a mistletoe plant, and they would go and they would believe that this was left, in fact, by the gods. So the Druids would remove the mistletoe using a golden knife during a ceremony, which was on the full moon following the winter solstice. And so this is why mistletoe is associated with Christmas today. The idea that it came directly as a sign from the gods, and so that by kissing under a mistletoe, you would receive the power in, Greeks, in the Greeks' mind, the power of Zeus, but in the Druids, it would be the power of the gods would come to you, and they would bless your lives by kissing under the mistletoe. And it's because of that seasonality that we actually have Christmas partially at that time as well. The Greeks loved using allegories and metaphors to teach people. And so what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about that and then get into some of the Greek myths. So allegory and metaphors are figures of speech. A metaphor is used as an expression to compare unrelated objects, and an allegory is basically just a longer version of a metaphor. It's a comparison on a much deeper note. As Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage and all the men and women and merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his act being seven, seven ages. Well, this is a metaphor because the world isn't a literal stage, and humans aren't scripted, we're not actors. The, world, the words refer to the seven stages of a person's life. An allegory. Stories in Aesop's fables are allegories, so we understand the messages. So the boy who cried wolf, we understand this is when you tell the, a lie too many times, you obliterate your trust. People will no longer trust you. And so when then the time comes that you need to be trusted, you can't. And it ends up leading to your own demise. So Pandora's box. The understanding is to start something that causes many new and unexpected problems. So Zeus gave Pandora, the first woman, a box with specific directions not to open it. So we already see what's happening here, right? We know what's happening. Here, sweetheart, here's this beautiful box, but you can't open it. What kind of a god gives a box and then says, don't open it? It's a test. It's meant to be a test. It's meant to help us understand something on a deeper level. So at one point, her curiosity got the best of her, and she opened the box. And what comes out of this box? All of the ills and diseases of mankind. And so I'm sorry, ladies, what happens is it always gets pushed on you, doesn't it? All of the woes of mankind, all of the wars that men fight, we can't take responsibility for it. So what do we do? We create this wonderful story that pushes it all off in this sweet, sweet girl. And guess what happens? It happens again in the story of Adam and Eve, right? So God places us in this beautiful, perfect environment, and he says, you're welcome to do anything that you want, Except, you see that tree over there? We call that the tree of life, the tree of wisdom. Don't touch the fruit. Don't touch the fruit. Don't even think about it. And so, man being what he is, stupid not thinking about it. He's got a naked woman standing right next to him. He's hardly thinking about fruit at this time. And then Eve goes to the tree, 
and picks that fruit. And she's seen here as the role almost of being a seductress, right? That the, the snake has tempted her and gotten her to take his side. And now she tempts Adam to take that apple and to take a bite of it, to take that fruit. And so we see here this similar story. And yet the difference is, is that in the story of the Hebrew scriptures, we can take a different meaning from it if we choose. We can see this idea of original sin, this moving away from God, but current religious understanding and thinking of this takes it a little bit different. Current theologians say, if this was in fact the tree of wisdom and the tree of life, Eve was really leading us from our childhood into our adolescence to help us pick the fruit of wisdom and saying to man, stop acting like a child. Take a bite of the fruit and become a man. Because when, she took, when they take a bite of that fruit, everything changes around them. Much like happens to us when we become adolescents. We no longer see the world in the same way. And we're not supposed to. Because we're now becoming adults, not only in our lives, but in this context, adults in faith. And so we ask God questions. And so it was this understanding now that we had gone away from God. But it's the same way that we want our children to go away from us at some point, because that means we've done our job, right? This is the understanding, a, a new understanding of the, of the role of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now, you can obviously choose which one you would like to believe, but therein lies the beauty of this. It's a story that is meant for us to understand this story at different stages of our life. We'll understand the story of Adam and even the story of Pandora very differently as children than we will as adolescents, than we will as young adults, and than we will in our older years. And that's the beauty of these stories, is that the story remains the same, but our understanding is nuanced by our perspective. Achilles' heel, common understanding, is a weakness that creates vulnerability. So Achilles was born, when Achilles was born, his mother dunked him in the river Styx. And the river Styx was supposed to make him immortal and impervious to any sort of, of power to kill him. There, nothing could kill him. But when she dunked him into the river Styx, she held him by the ankle, right? And when she pulled him back out, she forgot to turn him around and dunk his ankle in the water as well. So Achilles went throughout his life absolutely powerful, except for one thing, that damn heel. And sooner or later, it was going to be that his heel would get him into trouble. So, and this is another beautiful part of all these stories. They're all connected. So we see now Achilles, we'll, we'll blend into the next story too. So Achilles comes to us, he's in the Trojan War, right? So how did the Trojan War happen? So we have Paris and his brother, um, they go to, to visit the Trojans, they go to visit Greece, they go to visit the King Menelaus. Well, Menelaus is away and they meet this beautiful woman, Helen, and Helen is too gorgeous for them to resist. So Paris, being granted everything in his life, decides that he's going to take this man's wife. So they take this beautiful woman, Helen, and she's Helen, as we know later on, we did discover that Helen isn't just Helen. She's actually the daughter of Zeus and Leda, right? When Zeus comes in the form of a swan, seduces Leda, has the, the, the child Helen. So all of these stories are connected. So now they get back to Troy, and they have this war, right? So now Achilles is coming with uh, Menelaus and King Agamemnon, and they're at the beaches, and they're fighting, and then they're able to get in. And this is the next story. But uh, Achilles is killed by the arrow that Paris shoots a poison arrow and gets him in the ankle. And this is how he dies. So let's think about in today's modern mythology, right? How is Achilles similar to Superman. So we took these wonderful stories and then we brought them to modern time. So kryptonite, right? This is the idea that he was perfect and powerful, a, a, a friend of humanity, wanting to fight on the, on the side of righteousness, and yet anyone who had that little bit of kryptonite could bring him to his knees. The Midas touch. This is a particularly under, uh, interesting metaphor because we assign it to someone who is successful, right? We'll look at that guy with a million dollars or $20 million or billions of dollars and we'll say, man, that guy's got the Midas touch. And anyone who says that has never understood the story. Because the story of the Midas touch is that everything we touch turns to gold. And when we touch those things that turn to gold, we end up killing the things that we love. So the very understanding, we've, we've lost the whole point of this myth. This myth was about teaching us that 
We don't want to have these things. We don't want everything that we touch to turn to gold because in, eff- in essence, not everything should be gold that the things that we touch would die because we turn them to gold. And so it's the, a story that really talks to us about the dangers of wealth. And yet we've taken that entire story and we've changed it to saying it's a compliment that you have the Midas touch. When it's not, it should be considered, considered an insult. Beware of Greeks bearing gifts. This is a great one. I said it many times today to my friends uh, when we were having lunch that we were talking about Greeks bearing gifts. Beware people bringing you presents. They could be playing a trick on you. And now we come back to the story of Troy, right? So now Helen of Troy is back inside the gates. And now King Menelaus and King Agamemnon and Achilles have mounted their men. And they've all, and they're there for 10 years. And they can't get this wall down, this amazing wall outside the city of Troy. They can't bring it down. And so they said, you know what? What we're going to do, we're going to leave. And we're going to create this great big horse, and we're going to put our men inside of it. And so they leave, but they put their men inside. And then the Greeks, or the the Trojans, bring this horse inside, and all of the ships have gone, right? Except that they, inside here, they have all of the men, or many men, that come in under the cover of night. They open up the gates. They kill the people at the guard posts, and the ships come around the other side to the other bay and come over, and they open the gates, and the gates are wide open, and this is what leads to the downfall of the Trojans, and this is when Achilles is shot with a poison arrow by Paris. So phoenix rising from the ashes. The common understanding is to make a great comeback. But the phoenix is a mythological female bird that represents life after death and immortality. In our earlier version, I had immorality, and I had to change that quickly. So I just recognized that early, so we had some last minute. I don't want people thinking that the phoenix represents immorality. But the bird is a perfect example of rebirth. It's really a beautiful understanding that uh, from her own ashes, from her own funeral pyre, begins a new life. And so the idea here is that when the bird feels its life coming to an end, it builds its nest at the top of a palm tree. When her life ends, she is consumed in flames. And then as the flames die down from the ashes, a new life begins. The sword of Damocles. This is a great one. So the sword of Damocles is that people with great power live in constant state of fear and danger. So Damocles was a, a common man who would look at King Dionysus. And he saw this lucky King Dionysus, all these beautiful women, feeding him grapes and fruits and great meals and all of the great things that come with being a king, right? And so who wouldn't want to be that king? And so Damocles uh, says, you know what? I'd like to be king. And so Dionysus says, I'm going to make you king. And above him, he hung this dangerous sword with a single horsehair. And so underneath this chair, Damocles sat the entire time with all of the riches and all of the beauty and joy of being a king, all the luxury, but with the constant threat that at any second that horsehair could sever and that sword would come down and kill him. And it's an understanding that should be very close to home for all of us today that while we want, in the same way of Midas touch, the things that we often want, in the end we don't want. We don't want the responsibility that comes. And so it's here, the lesson is to live and to find the joy and the beauty in a simple life. Cassandra, here's another one that we get wrong. One whose predictions are true but never believed. A person who always predicts misfortune or danger. According to the myth, the god Apollo gave Cassandra the gift of seeing the future and then tried to sleep with her. However, she rejected him. How dare she? Didn't she know this was a god? You don't say no to sleeping with a god. That's what he thought. And so he punished her. He cursed her so that no one would ever believe her prophecies. And so after being cursed, she was met by disbelief from all of her family members. So she predicted the Trojan War. She predicted that Paris uh, would, would destroy the city. No one believed her. And so later on, this is the curse. But what we miss in this story, and we say today, oh, she's just a Cassandra right? Someone who says that everything is, is going to, the end of the world is coming or uh, everything is wrong, nothing is right, uh, the, the, the end of the world, you know, it's the chicken, chicken little story, right? But what we don't get is that it's the curse and that she's actually right. And so the idea of this is not to punish the Cassandra, but to listen deeper because the Cassandra, even though she's annoying and constantly saying that something might be coming to an end, 
she's all, she was the one cursed and that she might in fact be right. Caught between Scylla and Charybdis. We know this is caught between a rock and the hard place. But this was the ancient Greek story of caught between Charybdis and Scylla. The unfortunate situation of having to choose between two difficult choices or choosing between the lesser of two evils. Whoop. Sorry about that. So there were two places where they were trying to, the sailors were trying to sail around. On one side, they were going to hit these rocks with the monsters. And on the other side, they had this whirlpool. And so they had to make a choice between choosing between Charybdis or Scylla. And so the idea today is that we have to choose between the lesser of two evils or choosing between a rock and a hard place, being in a rock and a hard place. And then another one of the great messages that comes from this is confronting our monsters, right? How many of you, oh, that she had to confront her demons, has to confront her monsters. That's another phrase that we get from this. This was one of these choices. You have to confront them. You had to see them straight on, and you have to choose one of them. And that's a lesson that most of us have to face many times in our lives, choosing between the lesser of two evils or how to confront our own monsters inside of us. So in ancient Greek, the stories were often an part, um, important part of everyday life. They explained everything from religious rituals to the weather, and they gave meaning to the world that people saw around them. And these same stories remind us about what's important today. So the story of Heracles. Heracles was the son of Zeus. He was a demigod, and at one point in time, he would get very angry. Well, at one point, he killed his entire family. And so he had to go to be punished for that. And so we hear about the 12 labors of Heracles, where he had to do these labors to cleanse himself of the evil of having killed his family. So the lesson is to control your emotions and your anger and your strength, or else you'll spend the rest of your life paying for your mistakes. Heracles became Romanized as Hercules. So many of the gods that we know in Greek, Greece actually became Roman gods as well because the Romans weren't terribly invented. They just took all the great Greek gods and changed the names and then it readapted the stories for their own use. Listen to your elders and beware of hubris. The story of Icarus and Daedalus. So many of you know this story, uh, that they were in the maze uh, with King Minos. There's a story that we'll talk about uh, at another time as well. But uh, they, he created the wings. Daedalus created these wings for he and his son. And he said, follow me. Do as I say. Don't fly too high to the sun and don't fly too close to the water. Go the middle route, right? Buddhists would know and love this story. That fly the middle route. Go the middle route. And what he really meant was follow me. Do exactly as I say. Follow in my steps. But what he didn't do was listen to his father. Instead, he flew too high and his wings became scorched and the wax melted and the feathers burned and he fell to his death. And where he fell to his death is now known as the Icarian Sea, named after Icarus' death. So the lesson here is listen to your parents. And number two, don't let your pride be your downfall. This is a story I often have to remind people as I get older and my looks fade, that looks aren't everything, right? The story of Narcissus. So the story of, uh, and the word narcissist comes to us from the Greek myths. So Narcissus was this gorgeous man who fell in love with his own reflection. So imagine this man who was so gorgeous, he would walk around, just look at me, look how gorgeous I am. And so Echo, one day it was a mountain nymph, saw him, mountain nymph saw him, and she fell in love with this beautiful, beautiful man. And so she followed him around. And Narcissus would look around and see her, and he'd say, who is this? Who's there? And she'd say, who's there? So she'd repeat his words, as of course Echo would do, right? And she eventually revealed her identity, and Narcissus spurned her, wanted nothing to do with beautiful, poor Echo. She was heartbroken and spent the rest of her life in the hills and the mountains until nothing but her voice remains. And so today, you can hear Echo. All you have to do is call out, who's there? And she'll answer back to you. So Nemesis, the goddess of revenge, learned of this story and decided to punish Narcissus. So she lured him to a pool where, she, where he would see his reflection. And when he looked in the pool he fell in love with his own reflection. And there are two stories that, two ways to end this story. 
The, tradi the traditional version is that he eventually recognized that his love could not be reciprocated and he committed suicide. Another very popular version is that Narcissus fell so in love with his own reflection that he died of starvation looking at his own reflection in the water, that he couldn't pull himself away from looking at himself, and he eventually died from his own narcissism. And that speaks to us about the lessons here of, number one, don't like yourself too much. Don't take yourself so seriously. But that be kind to others. Be kind to those even when you feel that they're undeserving of you. Be open-minded to love and affection from others. And remember that looks aren't everything. Don't become obsessed with your own looks. Focus on what's inside and on what's inside others. This is where true love and fulfillment are found. So my thought for the day, I'm going to ask a question first. How many of you are happily married for a long time? Great. How many of you are just married for a long time? All right. <laughs> so... According to Greek mythology, I saw a couple of hands, but I'm not going to tell. According to Greek mythology, humans were originally created with four arms, four legs, and a head with two faces. Fearing their power, Zeus split them into separate parts, condemning them to spend their lives in search of their other halves. And this is the beauty of a strong marriage and partnership. When you find your other half, you're invincible and could be feared even by the gods such as the power of love. And so my hope for you all is that during this voyage, you'll be open to discover the power and the beauty and the meaning of myths. Thank you all for coming.